Now, Africa is a continent of 56, Africa is a continent of 56 countries who claim to run a democracy. However, according to the Democracy Index, only one country, Mauritius, qualifies as a full democracy. Seven countries qualify as flawed democracies and the rest fall under hybrid regimes and authoritarian leaderships. What I found interesting is that Nigeria qualifies as a hybrid regime, even if there have been democratic elections and it's in its fourth republic, and it's fourth republic in 1999. But conducting elections is only a measure of a democratic state. Pluralism, civil liberties and political culture remain necessary conditions. Dissenting voices should be entertained, not just for the fun of it, but because sometimes that's how we keep our elected leaders in check as part of the principles of democracy. That's how we wield our power as free citizens. Today, we'll be talking about how that works in African countries, particularly as it affects journalists and the media who are in charge of keeping the electorates informed, interpreting and putting issues in context. You're welcome to New Central's Debrief, the show where we dissect political, social and cultural issues and challenge the norms. My name is Ben Gabora, and today we'll be joined by journalists Tolulope Adelero Balogu and Jonathan Lyangyong, an astute journalist and uh, yeah, media practitioner. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thank Thanks you. Now, we'll start with that social media has, uh, I mean, the advent of social media is redefined how citizens and governments and corporations relate to each other. It's uh, been a game changer. You can find news break on social media first. A lot of news uh, breaks on social media first. We have what you call citizen journalists mm. and all of that. So how has the role of the media uh, changed since the advent of social media? Do you think... Are they complementing the role of traditional journalism? Is it a good thing? Or traditional uh, journalists just have to keep with the times? Um, I think the role of traditional media journalists have definitely changed. We are no longer the ones who solely control access mm. to information and access to the power players and access to the policy makers. There's a direct connection and engagement now because of social media. But beyond that, you have situations like breaking news. We are not only, we're not the only ones who break the news now. Yes. I think one of the things with traditional media and social media is that traditional media needs to hold on to its values and its ethics and remain a credible source. Many times when you have citizen journalism, there could be questions as to what source it is, what the mm. news is. So we have to hold on to being those people who put this news through a certain type of standard and quality check before we share it. And that's mm. one of the things I think we need to hold on to. I'll let Jonathan answer yeah, more And, from and here. Jonathan, does it, make, well, does it make life difficult for traditional journalists? Because uh, when the advent of fake news and then, I mean, it's first thing, a lot of news organizations will talk about first in breaking news because mm. it's that that's what puts you there you're always the first to and now you're competing with social media does mm -hmm. it make uh work difficult or are you under pressure to you know go the way of social uh, media i guess it's a potpourri of sort uh, but this no doubt has increased the times to become a time of transparency of mm -hmm. increased transparency like tolu said because monopolizing the scenario the situation mm. no longer exists yeah. so uh we we i think we have a situation where we rub off on each other and the lines are now growing and getting blurry yeah. in the sense that uh, who are citizen journalists who are traditional mm. journalists mm -hmm. we're having people who start out now as citizen journalists and then they mainstream they get on because like shows on in conventional broadcast space. We're having yes. shows and columns that are being driven by people who started out as citizen journalists. And then we're having people who are uh, traditional journalists who have become very famous in the social space. Yeah. Like yeah. Atolu, for instance, has <laughs> a great activity in the social and space. We've all yeah. yeah, so uh, so the lines are becoming thinner. Yeah. Uh, but the core is that the cream should always rise right, to, to the, the top. top. Yeah. And that's the place where... The cream that is the traditional, the trained professional yeah. the journalist. The profession, yes. The yes. professionals the ought to always stand out mm. because they are people who have an investment of training, uh, mm. familiarization with the ethos of the profession. They are professionals. And when you look at the definition And even of the gatekeeping aspect of it, which is very important. Yeah. 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 The profession doesn't just pop out. 
It's something that happens over several years mm. of consistency. Mm. I want to add something to that. And I do think, actually, it is, is now it is now more difficult. Mm -hmm. And that's because, number one, as you said, the competition. I have yeah. noticed media agencies and organizations that have actually failed because they're trying to do the clickbait. They're yeah. trying to be mm -hmm. first. And then because you live in a, a world where... Sometimes news organizations are picking stories from social media. They're getting certain things wrong. Mm -hmm. And you can see all the studies which are telling you now that there's a lack of trust or reduced trust in media, in news space. media yeah. um, organizations and in the civic space. And that has to do with how the access mm -hmm. to information is. So it's difficult, but it's a challenge that means we as professionals need to rise up so that we can do more and use the tools that social media provides. And not join the bandwagon and exactly. or try to, you know, the clickbait you mentioned. Yeah. Someone mentioned something once that would you allow, we talk about citizen journalists and all of that, they feel anyone could pick up the phone and, mm -hmm. you know, tweet, give situation reports and all of that. And I asked that, would you allow a citizen doctor, you talk about citizen journalists, <laughs> would you allow a citizen doctor That's a good to question. treat you? That's a good question. <laughs> now, on a scale of one to ten, where do you think uh, African journalists uh, for when it comes to um, calling out the ills of government mm. and um, <laughs> that, especially. Can I say gentlemen first? <laughs> <laughs> gentlemen first on this. <laughs> I, I would say I, I was mean, doing the ro the traditional role of journalism. I wish the, the question. Mm. I wish the question Stipulates. even, and I'm not. It, it's nothing wrong with your question, but I wish because it's a standard question that you get every now and again. But I wish the question even is that African journalists should be seen first as journalists and not African journalists. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, yes. geographically, there's nothing you can do about mm -hmm. being location. Mm. in a location. But, but practice-wise, you need to be a journalist who happens to be African. Yes. And having said that, then the standards need to be global. I think uh, journalists in Africa have done very much, in as much as you have uh, in the pack. There are also those who have failed to yeah. live up to expectation. But I think the re one of the reasons why we are here today is because a crop or several crops of journalists from Africa over the years have given their lives, mm -hmm. have stood up uh, in, and looked tyranny in the face and said, no, never again. And that's why we've had, though sometimes slowly, but an increasingly better Africa. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, what would you say are some of the challenges facing African journalists? Why they can't really speak truth to power? I do know about uh, security, fear mm -hmm. for their lives and all of that. What other factors are there? So aside from the security and fear from their lives when they are on the front, you also have insurance issues. And we can talk about journalists who have been injured and how mm. they or their families after them have been taken care of. We also have situations, who are the media owners? We also have to talk about the fact that a lot of media owners on the African continent sometimes are often cronies of government. So there can be situations where um, directives are passed down and a media house has said, you stay away from this story because if you go oh, into yes. this story, it'll affect my being able to dine with the people Yeah, and then power. sometimes you might be calling out businesses that support Exactly, you and businesses that pay advertising revenue. revenue. Yeah. So, it's, so it, it's a very delicate some, balance. Some people argue that uh, perhaps there needs to be a relook at the Ownership very thing. structure. No, I mean, the I mean the, even the very fu fundamentals that used to define journalism. Mm. Things mm. like being objective, uh, having no fear nor favor for uh, whoever is involved. You report the news as is because of many years that have come. Like we've mm -hmm. seen how Donald Trump, for instance, in America has mm -hmm. changed the narrative yeah. and he's called out media houses sometimes. Yeah, fake news. CNN yeah, I mean, that. rightly or wrongly, but we've seen that we are, our place is being tested. Yes. yes. And like, like uh, never before. Yeah. Like, I, I, <laughs> I would even not even just say tested. I think it's even being threatened. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the professions and ethics of being a journalist, I have no problem with citizen journalists. I do a bit have a problem a bit with bloggers and how they stand in this whole conversation. And how they think they're journalists. And how they think they're journalists. But I think also, we also have to talk about a citizenry that needs to be able to tell the difference. When you go to a blog, know that you're going to a blog. When you're going to a news medium and organization, know that your expectations of how that mm. news and information is, pre is presented to you is different than how you consume it on an info entertainment blog. But, but then again, Jonathan, I'm not sure if you would agree with me with this point uh, just to piggyback on what Tolu said some would argue that you know we're not matured enough the media shouldn't you, sensitivity mm. national security and all of that I remember during the Arab Spring I was presenting a show called diplomatic info and I had had everything 
sorted out. The topic was Arab Spring. Why is there no sub-Saharan African contagion? Like, why didn't it spread? Because the conditions in sub-Saharan Africa were similar, are even worse, the same. Or, yeah, or yeah. the same. <laughs> and my boss said, you know, this isn't going to fly because <laughs> you, you're like inciting the people. Why don't you go out there and... Yeah, well, so, sometimes uh, we have unfounded fears. And the truth is, uh, until you test certain things, and I say, look, my job as a journalist is to do my job. Mm. You can't blame me for threat to security. I'm not a security man. It is the job of the guys in the security business to mm -hmm. provide security, to make sure that there is no threat to security. Don't tell me to, do, to bend backwards in doing my job to make your job easier. Mm. I don't go around asking uh, someone in security services for story ideas when yeah. I want to yeah. write a story. So we always miss it. And remember that journalism comes as an offshoot of certain fundamentals. One of them is the freedom, uh, one of the freedoms. Uh, remember, people always think that any of those freedoms, those fundamental freedoms as contained in the UN Charter, they are not given by any government. Nope. They are not given by anybody. They're inherent. So the freedom of, for in, of information mm. is not given by anyone. You, you don't even have the right. So you can't even ask me to do something you do not have the right to yeah. tell me to do or not. Absolutely. Mm. So the, the security agencies, like in Nigeria, in broadcast media, for instance, yeah. we deal with issues where in the broadcasting code, they make a lot of uh, talk about how whatever you do needs to ensure that there is unity in the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, that you don't end, that like you don't yeah. encourage division. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember... It sounds like from 19... <laughs> 60s, I remember along with Ben, guys, having situations, <laughs> having situations yeah. where we were told that my radio show was being monitored by the DSS, and we had to be careful of certain things. And I remember having editorial meetings. As Jonathan said, we did not cause the situations, but those situations need to be talked about. And we have about. a responsibility to talk about this thing. Exactly. Yes. And then we have a responsibility if there is an elected or non-elected government official who's responsible for addressing situations, we have a responsibility to also put those people under focus. We have mismanagement issues. We have corruption issues. We have funds disappearing. We have babies dying, mothers yeah. dying. High incidences uh, so, of so HIV. I, I Why won't? I give you an, an now they like to talk about I give you a practical and, example. Yeah, Several yeah. years ago, uh, I was superintending over a station in the north, and I was managing this station. And one of our course, uh, one of our uh, presenter producers, mm. did a show and uh, spoke about the sensitive conversations that were happening about uh, polio vaccination. I remember. Mm. Uh, I to be or not to be, yeah. all of the conspiracy theories. And it so happened that the show airs maybe tonight or yes. yesterday or thereabouts, and there's an attack on uh, some uh, workers, some health workers yes. who no, are doing doing the the conducting campaign. vaccination. Yeah. And that station got the hammer. It was yeah. shut down for a year. Yes. It was shut down. First, besides being completely nonsensical to imagine that outrightly you can link, link this news to report to with the attack that a happened. case of terrorism. Mm. I mean, that wasn't the first terror attack that was happening on in that workers, space on, on health workers. Issues, yeah. The week after, there was another one. Yeah. Uh, and I was saying, oh, how come this station got shut down? Another yeah. didn't get. I mean, we probably should just keep shutting down all of the broadcast stations. So we don't filter. We're always mm -hmm. look. There's this scapegoatism yeah. Yeah. that exists. Looking and unfortunately for us in the media, especially in the broadcast media, we're always right there to point a finger. Very true. Now uh, we've seen something, some sort of pushback. I mean, it's unprecedented. One of the biggest news of the week: the Punch newspapers, uh, damning and scathing editorial, uh, saying they're going to refer to Mr. President as Major General. And then you had the signal, you know, the that took online it a bit people further. also <laughs> like to, you know, they want to bask in that glory, saying that they'll refer to him as dictator. Uh, what do you make of this? There was a lot of pushback. There were supporters, highly divisive issue, like most things we talk about in the Nigerian uh, political scene. Would it make a difference? And what do you think about the, the stand of the punch? The president handlers have come out to say, you know, it's a testament to the freedoms, freedoms that, you that you enjoy. Like, yeah, yeah he's a major yeah. general, he earned it. 
Uh, to you, I'm like, it's okay, okay, so um, <laughs> this is not the first editorial since yeah. President Buhari became uh, president in 2015 that has talked about his policies or anything uh, that has taken a stance. But this has been one of the hardest hitting. And it comes at a time where you have the Omaya Leishawari case, you have Abajilingo, mm -hmm. um, you have Jones Abari yet again still in custody mm -hmm. going to court. And we still don't understand why some of these people are being charged with the things they're being charged with. These are journalists who have been doing their jobs. So... I applaud Punch for taking that initiative because this is a country where you have an NBC that can find a way to come down heavy on them. Mm -hmm. They could lose advertising. We do. We have seen newspapers being shut down before. Um, so that is a stance that I applaud. And I think whether you agree with them or not, we need to get to the point where media agencies, media organizations are willing to take a stand on an issue and a very public and vocal stand at that. The signal. We're going to leave them alone mm -hmm. with what they yeah. said. But I think, I mean, I think Punch uh, is on Quite it. frankly, it's, it's also reflective of the times. Uh, and if you followed Punch, either from an editorial standpoint or from an administrative standpoint, they've been at uh, different times in our history, they've, they've made certain moves that has mm. put them in a, in a class of their own. Mm. Uh, they were one of the first, for instance, to get online and to sustain yeah. an active online presence. Uh, they did that while mm -hmm. others were trying to even figure out what is this. Yeah. Uh, and they've never made any mistakes about their editorial viewpoints. I yeah. think this has only, well, sometimes some things just, they just catch a fire that you can't explain. But they've had sometimes even more scathing remarks, I would say. However, the point not to be missed there is, there's never been a time like this time in our country where there are, digital hired guns mm. sitting down waiting oh, yes. to shout down any, any dissenting perceived voice. dissenting voice yeah and it is not good for anyone the lesson that we all must learn interestingly and ironically the president's uh, handlers are journalists some of mm. them have risen to some of the highest uh, positions I mean, the guild of in, editors president I mean, yeah. the, yeah. the two lead men there have got editorial uh, presidency of the Guild of Editors in Nigeria. Yes. I think their, their professional disposition is being tested. I'm not sure mm. if they are sitting back and looking at uh, marking the script that they, mm. they, they, are, they are acting out. And, but, and caring about posterity. Yeah, yeah, but the truth yeah. is, I think people don't read so much in this country. And those who read choose when to use what they've read. Because you can't say those presidential handlers aren't readers. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know where what they've read has gone to. Tyranny has been stared in the face mm. by journalism in Nigeria through the years. Yeah. Not even the most brutal, inclusive mm. of the then Major General Muhammad Dubari with, with his, his decree, his decrees, uh, one and decree, four. Yeah. And None has been able to stop active journalism and repress it to a zero level. It will not mm. happen. But you know, on that note, I do agree that it will not happen, but we also need to remember that the fight is consistent. The fight mm -hmm. is constant. Mm -hmm. And I think there mm -hmm. has been a point where We've sort, of, we've sort of sat back a bit. And mm -hmm. I think this has jogged a lot of people. And it's not just at the federal government level. And we have, we're oh, waking the country. Exactly. It is you worse, have it, it is at the worse, state it level. It is worse at the state level. I mean, we have level. governors. So a student is in jail be because of a Facebook set. post. Mm -hmm. We have yeah. a bank worker who's in jail. We have a doctor because they've made posts that are critical of state governors. So we can focus our attention on the government on the federal True. level. But there and is a general the macro, pressure the macro right now. Exactly. On the issue of freedom of expression. How do we deal with conflating dissenting voices with, um, you know, they say you're rocking the polity, you're, mm -hmm. you're, uh, hitting, you're, the polity. you're hitting the polity, you're inciting people. Those are just and then Nigeria, convenient I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but <laughs> when you have, everything is political. So yeah. you're calling the government out for not respecting court orders. You're, oppos you're tagged as an opposition politician or an opposition sympathizer. Why can't we stay on issues for the way I mean, the way they are. It's our job, interestingly. And when mm. you look at Section 22 of the Nigerian Constitution, where it specifically mm -hmm. uh, mandates the media to have a responsibility, even mm. though jokingly it does not provide cover the for the media yeah. wherever such situations arise. So you're giving someone a responsibility without uh, a, a corresponding uh, level of protection. Or something. Mm -hmm. However, something politicians and journalists have in common is our employers are the people 
or I would say we work for the people, mm -hmm. even if we're not directly employed by the people. As journalists, we have respective employers, yes. but our service it's is to the, to the people. people. The Politicians' head. job is to the people, and we are expected to hold them accountable. And we've seen, I mean, how important this job is. Radio France, and today, um, Radio uh, Rwanda in the 1994, and the effects of the media, how yeah. powerful it is. Now, that brings me to the discussion everyone is talking about. We have a few minutes to wrap up, so a uh, quick point. Social media bill, to be or not to be. They say, you know, people have abused social media, so you need some form of regulation. The wife of the president compared it to, to China. You know, if a billion, a country of a billion people could regulate their social media and make people more responsible, then why can't we? What's your take on it? It's not to be, absolutely not to be. And the idea is that we have defamation laws, we have slander, we have libel on the books. The kind of things that this um, bill is trying to sneak into Nigerian mm. legislation are things that we need to be very vocal, very consistent, and very loud and united about speaking against. Mm. And there are regulations in place. So we have to ask why these are the kind of things in a country that has so many negative indices mm. that have quickly gone through first reading, second reading, that are heading towards committee, <laughs> that's heading towards public hearing, and even fourth is reading. It, is it too late for the people to... No. Or are they, do, I have a humorous yeah. way of even looking at it. Uh, and I, So I choose my battles. Mm. Mm. Uh, clearly, there is an ulterior motive around this. As citizens, people need to stand up if yeah. they don't agree with it. As journalists, we know this is going to impede our work. Yep. However, I say, look, even if people then have their way and get it through, it is a lost battle. No problem. You would succeed in putting pressure on Nigerians in Nigeria not to say as much. I would see how you would chase all of the people who would set the agenda from outside of Nigeria. Good luck with that. Uh, it's a yeah. lost battle. I'm more concerned with the millions yeah. of us who are here <laughs> and they have our livelihoods a bit threatened on it. I really wish we had time. There's mm. still so much to cover. Maybe we'll do a part two someday yeah. uh, when they or if they or do not pass the social media. And that's if we still yes. have a job and a profession. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure talking to you both. Thank yeah. you very much. And uh, that concludes our discussion for today. Dissenting Voices in African Democracies have had the pleasure of talking to Tolu Adelaide Balogun and Jonathan Liamgun. It's Ambinga Baroa. See you next time on The Debrief. <laughs>